All right, so we will just uh, get started. So I will just uh, uh, read the questions and then we will uh, see what happens, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> so the question number one uh, is as follows. Dear Ajahn, can you explain the meaning of right view affected by the tanks? Um, I think the uh, idea and uh, the idea is that uh, it is a right view that is not yet purified. Yeah, it is a right view that uh, attains here is the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is not, not yet purified. Let me just see what the uh, Pali word is. Sa uh, asava, uh, so having having asavas, having having defilements. Yeah, attains here is another word of talking about asavas, about defilements, the outflowings of the mind. So it means that it's not yet pure, it's not the kind of right view of a stream entry, yeah? So this kind of right view, when you act upon it because it's not yet uh, achieved a stream entry, it means that uh, you are still going to get reborn, and that's what it means, and you will still kind of have the karma and these things when you, uh, uh, you know, the karma of the park that happens in ordinary life will still be carried with you, and then you bring that with you into the future. So it's affected by the taints. That just means that you are still a putujana, you're still an ordinary person, you're not a noble one yet. Uh, that is really what it means. Uh, so the idea comes down to this, you know, idea that um, a, a right view is purified gradually. Uh, it is a stage by stage thing. So, uh, you, you know, you come closer and closer to the truth uh, as you practice in the right way, as you read the suttas, as you understand the message of the Dhamma and all of these things, and you come closer and closer to what we want to go. And uh, that's really what it comes down to. Okay, uh, let me carry on. Dear Ajahn, how to reduce attachment for sensual pleasure step by step? Uh, thank you. Um, we are going to look at this in much more uh, detail later on because this is a very important part uh, of the Buddhist path uh, and uh, I would say uh, it is not so much an attachment to sensual pleasures well you can call it that if you like uh, but you can also think of it as an attachment to all the uh, sensory objects of the world uh, you know, the things in the world that we are attached to uh, things that you know like relationships or the possessions that we have or maybe the uh, the praise that we get or the honor that we have or the status we have and all of these kind of things. Uh, so the way to reduce that attachment is really uh, what I was mentioning before, to understand the danger in that world, uh, to understand how it is so utterly unreliable, to understand how quick, easy it is for people to get sick, for people to die, how easy it is for the world to change for the worse, how you get climate change, how you get all of these kind of things. Uh, and the more you understand how unstable that world is and how unreliable it is, uh, the less attachment that you will, you will have. Uh, but one of the things that you have to uh, remember is always to not to go too far with this. Uh, yeah? If you go too far with this kind of thinking about the world being difficult or whatever, you might end up getting depressed. Uh, and I know some people who got really depressed by thinking about the Dhamma in the wrong way. So please don't get depressed. Yeah? That, that is kind of really counterproductive if you do that. Uh, so make sure that you have a, a balance. You need to build up the good feelings uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, feeling good about yourself, and then at the same time, understand the dangers in the world. So you have a balance in these things. Uh, and if you do it wrongly, then uh, it, will be, it will not work out. Uh, so to do it step by step, do those things that you feel comfortable with, yeah? And do things that you feel are helping you to let go, uh, uh, re reminding yourself very gently, you know, if the world is going wrong, then think, actually, maybe the world isn't going wrong. Maybe this is just the nature of the world. Uh, you know, you have the COVID situation. Is the COVID, is that wrong? Uh, or is it just part of the world? Is, this, is it just the way the world works? Uh, and you will actually, if you reflect on this in the right way, you realize that COVID, there's nothing wrong with COVID. It is actually the way the world works. The world is like this. And you may feel that that is unfortunate or it is hard to deal with that. But eventually, if you keep on thinking about this in the right way, you will start to 
actually understand the problem with the world, why it matters, why it is so important to let it go. And sometimes we need almost like shocks to the system, if you like, to be able to let go. I, you know, I obviously know many people who have lost people who have been very dear to them, loved ones, uh, parents who have lost children. One of the most difficult things in life, perhaps, is a parent losing a child. Uh, and people have grieved enormously over those things and have felt it was terrible. Uh, but in the long run, they said it was a blessing. Uh, what looks like a disaster in the short term, losing someone very close to you, a close family member, uh, if you are wise about it, uh, you overcome the problem, uh, then in retrospect, looking back, maybe one or two years afterwards, uh, you actually realize that, uh, wow, um, uh, uh, I have learned so much through this very, very difficult period. And what we learn is basically the danger of the world, and how unreliable it is, how people, we cannot rely on anything in that world, things that are so uncertain. That is what we learn. And uh, yeah, in the long run, that can actually be for our benefit. I love the story which Adam Brahm always tells, and you, you know, you may, uh, you probably all of you heard it, heard it before. Uh, the story of good, bad, who knows? Uh, and we never know whether something is good for us or bad for us. Uh, it's just so hard to know. It may be painful now, but maybe it will be for the long-term benefit. Uh, and then there are other things that may feel make us feel very happy now, but in the long term, it may be to our detriment. Uh, this is kind of the strange thing about this, yeah, is that it's so hard to really pinpoint whether something is good or bad. And uh, because of that, you, you know, you, 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 you don't buy into things so easily. You take a step back, you get a bit more perspective, uh, and you just try to follow very gently along uh, with the teachings of the Buddha. Later on, on this retreat, I will uh, have a look at seven similes that I I like to read out on every single retreat. Uh, and these are the similes that uh, allow us to understand the world of uh, sensual pleasures in a different way. Yeah, it allows us to um, understand the problems of the sensory world. Uh, and this is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things I would like to, uh, to talk about later on in this retreat. Uh, hopefully then you get more understanding of what uh, this is about and how to deal with these things. Uh, so let's see what comes of that uh, later on. Um, okay, let's go, let's move on to the next question. Um, okay, in the, here we have one from the uh, okay, so from the Sanyukt Agama. Okay, this must, must be the parallel to the uh, Majjhima Nikaya Sutta we just saw. Uh, SA seven eight five. It's a sutta in the uh, probably the Ch Chinese translation, probably. <coughs> And the transcendent right view is mentioned as the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, there you are, exactly. Does that mean that right view retains uh, for good rebirth, while transcendent right view uh, is for liberation? Um, in a sense, you can say that, but uh, uh, even, the, uh, uh, yeah, even the right view retains, it is still leading towards the transcendent right view, yeah? It is not just for rebirth. I mean, nobody just wants to be reborn. Ideally, we all want to go beyond that. Uh, but it is like a temporary right view. Yes, it may lead to good rebirth, uh, but it is also important to remember that it also leads to liberation down the track. Yeah? So you use that ordinary Lokia right view, you use that as far as it goes, uh, and eventually it becomes the higher right view, the transcendent right view, and then it leads to liberation as a consequence. So the ordinary right view is like two purposes. It leads to good rebirth, yeah, might as well have a good rebirth, yeah, there's no need to kind of suffer uh, too much. And on the, so that's the one hand, on the other hand, down the track, it also leads to liberation itself. Okay, Sukihotu Ajahn, I have always been confused about right view, and I'm still confused. <laughs> How do I apply right view in my daily challenges in life? My apologies, I became more confused after you read the last two suttas about the twofold right view. Oh, I apologize, that's terrible, isn't it? I, I'm confused, making things even worse. Okay, so how do you apply it in ordinary right, in ordinary life? Well, so right view, yeah, is, is about 
seeing the world in the right way. So it means that you understand the importance of morality. And here is one of the fundamental ideas of right view. Morality really matters. Why? Well, because morality, if you are moral, you're going to be more happy. And if you are immoral, you're going to be less happy. This is one of the basic ideas of right view. Yeah, you understand the consequences of acting in the wrong way. And the more deeply you understand that, if you understand that in a very, very deep way, and I did talk about this earlier on today, that if you understand this in a very deep way, you will always try to be moral. I call this Yoniso Manasikara before, uh, wise, uh, wise attention, but you can also call it right view. It's the same thing. It doesn't really make much difference. Yeah. So this is... The, or, the ordinary right, you have you apply it in daily life, really understanding the significance of morality. Uh, yeah? This is one way of thinking about it. Uh, uh, the other way is to be less attached to the world. This is what we've been talking about now, not taking the world so seriously, understanding that the world is always going to pro be problematic, is always going to let you down. So you don't focus so much on the world. You don't try to achieve things so hard in the world because you know that those achievements in the world are unreliable, uncertain. You have no idea whether you will actually be able to achieve those things. You become more interested in the process, how to get there, than the result, because the result is always going to be uncertain. uncertain. But you know that the process, how you get there, is something you can control. Yeah, You can control whether you get to your result with kindness or by being... Uh, ruthless, yeah, maybe you think ruthless is good because then you will get the goal, but what if you don't get the goal, yeah, then you have been ruthless, you made bad karma, and also you don't get the goal, but if you have been kind, at the very least, you will have made good karma, and you will have acted for your long-term happiness in the future, yeah? yeah, so this is how you, how you think about things, this is how you use this idea of right view, Right view is also about um, one very practical aspect of right view is using non-self so that you remind yourself that people are not really in charge of their lives. And there's no one to be angry with them because people are just conditioned phenomena. So they do things not because they want to be nasty towards you. They do things because they have no choice. Yeah, they are conditioned in this way. How can you not have compassion? How can you not have metta? For someone who is conditioned. So um, and this is the, uh, the opposite. All of these are right ways of thinking about right view. Yeah? The idea of rebirth, yeah? remembering that if you are going to be reborn, you have to think about the long term. You have to develop your mind so you bring a good mind with you into the future instead of focusing too much on things in this life, etc. etc. All of these things are about right view. Yeah, this is a practical right view. Be careful not to be sidetracked by intellectual things because the intellectual things don't mean anything unless they actually have practical purpose. All of these things should have practical purposes at the end of the day. So stay with the practical things. Stay with the simple things. So I have always found that it is the simple things that are the most powerful for me in my life. Really basic things like just be kind, yeah? That's hard enough already. There's plenty enough right there to work with that. But for that to be possible, strengthen that right view of why kindness really is so important. So I hope that helps a little bit. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, also, you said right view means not to forcefully push ourselves to correct our mistakes and beat up ourselves when we weren't mindful about our action. Sense appreciate your advice on how we go about this. So, um, I will talk about this uh, much more later on, but uh, um, uh, so, so um, the idea here is to try to learn rather than to try to use force. Yeah, so you try to learn why you are going wrong. You try to learn causality, cause and conditions. Uh, how you can apply yourself uh, better in the future. And uh, through learning in this way, you actually uh, learn about yourself, why you're going wrong. If you beat yourself up, uh, it is never going to be helpful. If you beat yourself up, uh, all you do is you uh, 
you tend to block your ability to learn because the beating up means that you are um, uh, you're not accepting yourself yeah? and that lack of acceptance of yourself uh, means you cannot see things clearly but if you stand back instead and you just observe what is going on uh, yeah and you see the causes the conditions that lead you to go in a certain way you can get an insight into your actions get an insight into what makes you tick into why you're making these mistakes and when you understand why you're making mistakes uh, then you will be able to change yeah because you understand okay I make this mistake, I get angry because I'm looking at this person in this way. How can I look at this person in a different way? You change your view of that person, and then you change the, uh, your, your actions as a, and your result as a consequence. So. Okay, um, let's go on to the next one. So, uh, what is the Arvij Asana? And so this is the uh, uh, defilement of ignorance, yeah, and this can be understood uh, really as not understanding the Four Noble Truths, uh, yeah, this is the Arvij Asana, uh, or it can be understood as uh, the idea of not being an Arahant, not being fully enlightened, etc. Uh, but um, the thing is that of the three Asanas, uh, uh, the two first ones are the most important. And in fact, the first one, the Kama Asura, is by far the most important one because that is the one that blocks us from gaining Samadhi. The second one, the Baba Asura, the uh, uh, attachment to existence, uh, is much more profound. That is the problem of the feeling of I am, which has to do with the, uh, the, that Asura. So, um, uh, the Abhijas Asava, in many ways, it is just the sum of the first two Asavas. Yeah? Abhij Asava is almost, there isn't much added to Kama Asava and Baba Asava. Abhij Asava is almost like those two combined. It's a different way of thinking about the Asavas. Because Abhija, how do we experience Abhija? Well, it is experienced in the sense that we have an interest in the external world of the five senses. And it is also experienced in the sense of uh, the I am delusion, yeah? The, the wanting to exist, especially wanting to exist in future lives. That is how it is experienced. Uh, so it is very closely related to the first two ones. Uh, so uh, if you focus on the first two ones, basically you are, that is really sufficient. Uh, Okay, let's go on to the next one. Should a lay person refrain from giving Dhamma talks since one is still developing one's body, virtue, mind, and wisdom? Uh, I, I would say no. I would say that giving a Dhamma talk, I think, is a, uh, always a very nice opportunity. Yeah, When you have to teach others, it really gives you a chance to develop further, it gives you a chance to reflect on these teachings. In fact, teaching is a great way to learning about the Dhamma because you really have to study, you really have to feel that you know what you're talking about. It's, nothing is worse than sitting on a, you know, on a high seat and giving a talk and feeling you don't understand what you're doing. And this is a terrible feeling. Yeah? So you should, I would say, take the opportunity. Yeah? If someone is a opportunity to give a Dhamma talk, actually, it is a great chance for you to improve your understanding of the Dhamma. So please take it. If you look at the suttas, uh, the Buddha, uh, when he talks about the idea of giving Dhamma talks, uh, he doesn't say that you have to wait till you become a stream enter. He doesn't say that you have to wait till you become uh, have good samadhi. Yeah, None of those are actually requirements. Uh, and sometimes it seems that giving Dhamma talks can come quite early on, yeah, on the, on the Buddhist path. Uh, so uh, uh, the only thing you have to do is to be careful. Uh, and if you don't know, be honest about not knowing. Yeah, and just say, I don't really know. Uh, and then use that as an opportunity to study and to go deeper and try to understand what is going on. Uh, and if you do it that way, there is no real danger that you're going to go wrong. Uh, and make sure that you use good sources for your answers for when you teach. Uh, Use ideally the suit as the word of the Buddha. Make sure that it all fits with the word of the Buddha. And if you do that, if you are careful, if you are honest, if you have integrity in what you do, then really there shouldn't be any great danger. 
Yeah. So uh, don't try to be perfect before you teach, because otherwise you're never going to teach. And see it rather as an opportunity to increase an understanding. Of course, you know it is good to have some understanding. Yeah, don't go too fast, but uh, uh, also don't go too late either. Find the find the middle way again. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Suki Hotu Aja. Regarding the twofold right view uh, with the taints and taintless, can we interpret as a still having attachment with samsara, i.e. the self and the world? Uh, however, two transcending the self of the world. Thank you. Um, yes, something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the main point is just that the preliminary right view is not perfected yet. So when you have the ordinary right view, the Lokya right view, it just means that it is a, it is not complete. It is still needs to be purified. You need to study more, you need to practice more, etc., etc. And as you do that, that view will gradually become purified. Yeah. And then when you get to the uh, Lokuttara view, the kind of the world, the transcending view, or whatever you could call it. Uh, that is, as you say, precisely the, the view that leads to Nibbana. Yes, yeah? so it leads to going out of samsara. The uh, first view, which has taints, uh, it does not lead immediately out of samsara, but, but uh, it leads indirectly to getting out of samsara because that preliminary right view ultimately leads to the full right view. Yeah, so we cannot really distinguish them that completely. They're still very closely linked with each other now. Okay, next question, please. Okay, this question is about Yoniso Manasikara. During meditation, when the sleepiness starts to seep in, instead of attending to the sleepiness, uh, maybe need to use wisdom power to direct attention to the breath. Is this an example of Yoniso Manasikara? <coughs> also, how to direct my attention away from sleepiness. Sleepiness has always been my biggest hindrance in meditation. Thank you. Um, yeah. If you have sleepiness, then the breath is not going to work, yeah, because the breath is going to make you even more sleepy, yeah, because the breath is very calming, it's a soothing thing. It's something that kind of uh, makes you think even less. Yeah, it's very pacifying. Yeah? And because it is calming and pacifying, going to the breath is not really going to work. Yeah? So what you have to do instead is you have to try to do something which is more inspiring. Yeah, uh, Try to reflect on how fortunate you are to have these marvelous teachings. Uh, how fortunate you are to have so many good Kalyana mittas in the world. Uh, uh, reflect a little bit on all the good work that you have done, yeah, and rejoice in all the good things that you have done. Do something that brightens up the mind, uh, yeah, that gives you a sense of, uh, of uh, um, that you're heading in the right direction, and that you have got something very beautiful to support you in your life. Uh, and if you do that, then uh, there is a chance that the sleepiness will uh, disappear. Um, but um, Remember that sleepiness, very often, it comes really from the first two hindrances. So I would say what you really need to investigate is how you can reduce maybe the first two hindrances and how you can do more of the good stuff that brightens up the mind. Yeah? Quite likely there is an, a certain attachment there to maybe, I don't know if, if you are a person who gets irritated and angry easily, that might be one problem. If that is not the problem, maybe you have very strong attachments in life, yeah? And all of these things will tend to make your mind sleepy because they are problematic in this way. Yeah? So let go a little bit of the world. Yeah? Sometimes it's just a matter of develop, developing all the basic aspects of the path even more powerfully. Yeah? Learning to let go a little bit more, giving up the ill will, having more metta, more compassion for people, and all of these things. And as you do that, you will find that in the long term, your sleepiness will be overcome. It is very often, it is almost impossible to give up sleepiness itself, because sleepiness often is a symptom, not a cause. So very often, you cannot just direct your mind away from that. You have to find a deeper reason for what is going on there. And... Uh, 
Certainly, a lack of inspiration is one of those problems, uh, but sometimes you just have to develop the other factors of the path even more, uh, and then uh, ultimately you will overcome that. Uh. So try to investigate a bit more uh, and, uh, and see what happens. Uh. Okay, this is from Lai Lai Xian. Yep, is that no? That was I think that was the one that no. Yeah, okay. Uh, Q and A session, dear Ajahn, can you please explain the characteristics and the differences of Kandika Samadhi and Upachara Samadhi? Many thanks, sir. Um, these are both of these terms are terms found in the commentaries. Uh, yeah, Upachara Samadhi is found quite a lot in the Visuddhi Manga. Kandika Samadhi is found uh, uh, in the mostly in the commentaries to the Vasudhi Manga, maybe found in the Vasudhi Manga a couple of times, but mostly in the sub-commentaries. So these are not really terms used by the Buddha, and as such, they're not so important in my opinion. Upachara Samadhi not found in the suttas, nor is Kandika Samadhi. But the difference is, very briefly, and I'm not an expert in the commentary of Pali, but anyway, very briefly, Upachara Samadhi is a samadhi you have before you enter jhana or after you come out of jhana. Yeah? It is upachara samadhi, means like neighborhood stillness. Uh, it's in the neighborhood of jhana. It is close to jhana, but hasn't quite reached the jhana state, uh, stages yet. Uh, kandika samadhi is, uh, kandika means momentary. Yeah? So kandika samadhi is, uh, uh, it, it, is more the idea that it's something often related to insight. Uh, and it is the idea that when your mind is uh, uh, moving, you know, ha has some kind of insight or, or, or something, even though the mind is kind of changing all the time, uh, there's a certain focus happening as, you, uh, as the mind is changing, you're staying with the subject. The subject may be a changing subject, uh, but you're not moving outside of that subject. Uh, Something like that is what it means. But uh, really, if I were you, I would not be too concerned about these kind of terms uh, because they are really outside of the scope of the suttas. Uh, the Buddha just uses the word samadhi pretty much all the time. Uh, and the word samadhi just uh, you know, means, in the sutta, it means the jhana states or something like that. Uh, and that is what I would focus on. If you go too much into the... Uh, commentarial ideas, and I think that uh, very often we just kind of end up doing things that are not uh, as useful or as uh, directly, you know, the path isn't as straight anymore. We start from going a little bit backwards uh, and it becomes a little bit more problematic as a consequence. So. Okay, let's go on to the next question. <clears throat> uh, so here we have the uh, MN43, the Mahavedana Sutta, uh, and I uh, M4313 mentioned that there are two conditions for the arising of right view, the voice of another and wise attention. Appreciate, uh, uh, if I can explain further what constitutes the voice of another. So the, um, the voice of another, uh, this is a paratogosa in Bali, and uh, this just means that we uh, tend to need to hear the Dhamma from somewhere before we even get started, yeah? So the voice of another, for example, would be like the voice of the Buddha, yeah, hearing it from the Buddha. You don't really get started until you hear the Dhamma from somebody. It could mean reading the suttas, because reading the suttas is obviously the word of the Buddha. It could mean uh, hearing the Dhamma from anyone who is a noble person, anyone who is an Aryan who understands these particular teachings. Uh, all of this would be the voice of another, hearing it from someone who has understood it. And uh, in the sutta, this is considered very important. Uh, yeah? uh, it is often, you know, as you would probably know, you find in the suttas the idea uh, where Ananda goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha that uh, um, Kalyanamitta is 50% of the holy life. And the Buddha says to him, don't say that, Ananda. Kalanamitta is 100% of the holy life, yeah? And this is the idea of Padatogosa, Kalyanamitta. It's the same kind of idea. You have a friend, you have a spiritual friend or a spiritual supporter who gives you access to right view. 
Uh, the Buddha is called the eye of the world. Yeah? He's the one who kind of has sees first. Uh, and because he sees first, uh, then he then opens up the ability uh, for people to, uh, other people to see uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, and that is then the, uh, the right view. So uh, most of us, we need both these things. You need, first of all, the right view. And then you, sorry, the, the voice of another, which is right view. And then you need Yonisamana Sikara to recognize that right view, recognize the voice of another, and then develop it further onto the path. Yeah, these are the two factors coming together. And then you are, uh, becomes the condition for becoming a stream entry down the track. Yeah. Okay, so next one from Chia Chin Lo to everyone how to overcome attachment to sensual pleasures, yeah, or the sensory objects of the world. Uh, the answer is you have to uh, do it very gradually. Uh, again, you have to understand the dangers of things in the world. Uh, and the more you understand those dangers, uh, the more you tend to let go. Also, you have to develop the positive qualities so you have somewhere else. Uh, if all you see is the dangers of the things in the world, if all you see is the negative things and how difficult it is, uh, uh, it's, it's not going to work. You also have to find happiness somewhere else. Uh, if you find happiness somewhere else, uh, it will allow you to detach from the sensory objects of the world. Uh, yeah, we cannot have a life without happiness, uh, so we need that balance in there. Now, we'll talk about this much more later on because we have some beautiful suttas about this. Uh, which kind of give you an insight into what this really is about, how to deal with it. So. Dear Ajahn, how can one live in the human world without an identity? Isn't being kind, compassionate, and caring part of the I? <laughs> uh, yes, how can you live in the human world without an identity? Um, uh, you, the idea of giving up your sense of identity is a very gradual thing, yeah? But I will give you an idea of how you can live in the world without identity, and it's very simple. Uh, if you meditate, yeah, and the deeper your meditation is, the less you think. Yeah? A very important part of our identity is our thinking. So if you reduce the thinking in meditation practice, you have less identity, you have less sense of I, yeah? So a person who doesn't think very much, a person who has a very peaceful mind, is a person who has less, less identity. You're not without identity yet, but you have less identity. Yeah? And you start to say that having less identity is actually very nice because not thinking too much, not having a very busy mind is actually a very useful thing and a very happy thing. Yeah? And you are right. One of the things to understand about the Buddhist path is that the idea of identity is something that you let go of gradually. Yeah, you cannot let go of identity all at once. So first of all, uh, you uh, place your identity in a positive, you have your identity in a positive place. Yeah, you identify, as you say, with being kind. You identify with being compassionate. You identify with being caring. And in this way, you are kind of having a more refined kind of identity, yeah? And that refinement of the identity is part of the path. So you refine your identity, and that refinement of identity, you make it more and more refined, until eventually you come to the point where you can give up the identity altogether. That is the purpose of the path. So you notice, you notice there's a ladder, yeah? It's also like a ladder of attachment, it's the same thing. You attach to more and more refined things. That's very similar to having identity because we tend to attach to our identity. These are very closely related to each other. You attach to more and more refined things until eventually you can give up attachment altogether. And in this way, you kind of take this path and you move forward and stage by stage according to your ability. So uh, it is all about you know, uh, understanding the path. But remember that not having an identity is actually very nice. Uh, check out in your meditation, as the things die down, as you have less thinking, as you have less activity in your life, yeah, as your mind becomes peaceful, what does it feel like? Yeah? And what you will see is that actually it feels very nice. Less identity is a positive feeling here. Yeah?
Okay. Uh, thank you, Ajahn, for your gift of the Sutta teaching. There is more ease and peace in life as a result of listening to your talks. Yay! <laughs> okay, that is marvelous. I'm very glad to hear that. So uh, it is working. Yeah, it is the word of the Buddha that is kind of making itself felt. Uh, and what a marvelous thing that is. Uh, in trying to be kind and compassionate in dealing with people, how do we handle people who treat us as a pushover? <laughs> um, so sometimes, you know, you uh, uh, there, there is sometimes uh, you don't worry too much about what other people think or what other people do. Uh, yeah, people in the world, there are so many silly people in the world don't really understand what is going on. Uh, so don't worry too much. There's always going to be people who treat you in a bad way and who are stupid and don't really understand what is right. Uh, so to avoid that a little bit, uh, yeah, one of the things that you can do is not to be too much with such people. Uh, make sure that you hang, hang out with people who are good Kalyanamitas and people who understand to uh, appreciate you for your qualities, who don't push you, you know, treat you as a pushover, as you say because it's very unpleasant to be treated as a pushover. You know? So just hang out less with those people. Uh, hang out with the people who are good and kind and caring and who know how to uh, treat you in the right way. You know? um, the other thing to do is that you can be kind and compassionate, but you can also be assertive sometimes. It is okay to be a little bit assertive. And if you feel the need sometimes to tell people that, you know, uh, you know, please don't treat me in this way or, you know, look at things in a different way. You can say that as long as you say it with kindness, as long as you say it with a sense of care. Yeah, you can be a little bit firm sometimes. That is okay. And uh, you can see even the, you know, even the Buddha in the sutta, sometimes he is a little bit firm with the monks. And you see people like Ajahn Brahm, you know, or some of the great teachers around the world that, they can also be firm sometimes. They're not always kind of, you know, as you said, they're not always pushovers, yeah? Ajahn Brahm is not pushover, wouldn't you agree? Try, try to push Ajahn Brahm over and you will have a big surprise. You're going to have a really hard time pushing Ajahn Brahm over. I can, I can assure you that. Uh, so Ajahn Brahm has a very, he's very strong and at the same time very gentle, yeah? So don't be afraid of sometimes saying your opinion, but say, say it in a constructive way. Don't say it with anger. Yeah? Don't say it in the wrong way. And then I think you'll be hopefully on the right track. Yeah? Okay. Let's take a couple of more questions. Uh, so, dear Ajahn, is the cutting of trees to make way to build the house considered killing and greed? Um, Cutting of trees uh, to make way to build a house is it killing? Not really. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, look at the suttas, the five precepts of lay people. The first one is pana tipata veratmani sikaparang samadhyami, and pana means breathing beings. So basically, it means animals. The word animal also is derived from the Latin word for breath. Yeah. So it is all about breathing beings. The trees are not breathing beings in the same way that animals are breathing beings. Uh, so there's nothing really in the uh, suttas that say that killing animals, okay, sorry, killing trees is bad. It is true that the monks have a rule against cutting down trees. Uh, but uh, again, it seems to have been laid down, not because it is bad to uh, cut down trees, but more because it was a custom at that time that samanas, ascetics, uh, they're not supposed to cut down trees. Uh, yeah, that seems to be the main reason why this is this is happening here. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't uh, worry too much about that, uh, as long as you are not cutting down, you know, tr the wrong trees at the wrong place. Uh, what is illegal, or maybe trees that other people really like, or or whatever. So just do it in a kind and compassionate way, and I don't think that is a is a big problem. No. Um, okay. Uh, what are the three asanas? One is Kama asana, the other is Bhava asana, and the third one is the Avijja asana. Avijja, yeah, the uh, asana of delusion, or the asana of uh, ignorance, uh, which is the last one. Uh, 
of the three here. So that is one that needs to be added to your list there. Huh? And then you have, have all three of them. These asavas well, will come up later huh? in this uh, in, in this sutras. Huh? And uh, then we can maybe talk about them even, actually I talked about them quite a lot already, uh, but they certainly come up later on and you will be able to see them right there on the suttas as we uh, carry on. Huh? Okay, so uh, is that it, Bobby? Is that the end of the question, sir? Yes, Achan, that's the uh, end of the questions for today. Okay, great. So uh, um, maybe maybe it's nice. We can do a little, let's just do a little bit of chanting at the very end. We'll just do the homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and just to kind of uh, call it a day. I would like to do that at the end of the day because it's just as a kind of closing. So we'll just do the Arahant Sama Sambudo. So uh, you, I'll just do the chanting. You can do it on your own if you like it or whatever you prefer. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagava Udang Bhagavantang Abhivademi Svaka to Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Okay, everyone, that's all for today. So we'll see Let us give three bows to Achan. Great. Okay, we'll see you. Have a, have a good night. Have a good night. Rest and we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Yeah.